very interesting comments. You remember I said in my opening speech I would uh, present my six arguments for God's existence. In this speech, I want to respond to uh, Dr. Stinger's arguments against God's existence. Now, his fundamental argument was that if God existed, then God's existence should be detectable in some way, but it's not, and therefore God does not exist. Now, how does this argument go? What are the premises of this argument? Well, in his book, uh, on page 22, he lays out the argument more rigorously. It goes like this. Premise one, probably, if God were to exist, then there would be good objective evidence for his existence. Two, but there is no good objective evidence for his existence. Three, therefore, probably, God does not exist. Now, this is a logically valid argument, so the only question is, are those two premises true? Well, let's look at them. What about the first one? Probably, if God were to exist, there would be good objective evidence of his existence. I'm not confident that that premise is true. I can think of at least two reasons why God might not provide such evidence. Number one, he might provide a way of knowing that he exists apart from evidence. For example, he might build into us a cognitive faculty that uh, innately ex uh, apprehends his existence. Or he might testify to our spirits through his spirit, drawing people to a knowledge of himself. These sorts of inner ways of knowing God would have the advantage of not being dependent upon a person's personal circumstances, like his literacy or access to libraries and so forth. And this isn't just a speculation. This, in fact, represents the theory of knowledge or epistemology of one of the most eminent uh, Christian philosophers today, Alvin Plantinga, who does maintain that God has created us in such a way that we can know that God exists, wholly apart from evidence, through the cognitive faculties that God has imbued into us. But another way in which this premise might not be true is that God could provide such evidence selectively only to persons who he knew would respond to it if they were to receive it, but not to persons who he knew would not freely respond to it. Now, Vince Stinger said in his last speech, but such a God would be immoral, he would be evil to provide evidence only selectively. Not at all. God is under no obligation to provide evidence to persons who he knew would reject it even if they had it. So long as God provides evidence to anyone who he knew would freely respond to it if they received it, God could do it in that way. So I'm not at all confident that that first premise of Vic Stenger's argument is true. It seems to me to be very dubious. But, but let that pass. Suppose that if God existed, he would give objective evidence for his existence. He needn't do it in the ways that Dr. Stenger has stipulated. For example, imparting supernatural knowledge or prayers for healing or things of that sort. He could, for example, raise Jesus from the dead miraculously. Or he could create a universe with a beginning. Or he could plant his moral law on the hearts of all men. In other words, he could do exactly what he has done. On pages 231 to 33 of his book, Dr. Stinger lists 11 observations which, if observed, would confirm the existence of God. And I was uh, amused when I read these because I think that at least seven out of the 11 are in fact observed. So I think we do have good evidence for the God hypothesis. So the first premise of his argument I think is uh, not proven to be true. The second premise is outright false and therefore it is not a sound argument. Now let me look specifically at the cosmological evidence for the existence of God because this is relevant to that third argument I gave, the cosmological argument. You remember that argument goes like this, everything that begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. 
Dr. Stinger disputes this by saying, no, the average density of the universe is zero, and therefore it doesn't need to have a cause. Well, now, frankly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think this rejection is something of a bad joke. The idea here is that the positive energy associated with matter might be exactly counterbalanced by the negative energy associated with gravitation. So, on balance, there is zero energy, and the inference then is drawn, therefore no cause of the universe is needed. Now, this is like saying if you go on a round-trip journey and retrace your outbound trip exactly to come back to the place you started, then your net motion is zero, and therefore there needn't be any cause of your journey. Or if your assets and your debits are exactly counterbalanced, your net worth is zero, and therefore there's no cause of your financial situation, which would be obviously absurd. Christopher Isham, who is Great Britain's leading quantum cosmologist, points out that there still needs to be what he calls ontic seeding, that is to say, a cause to create the positive and negative energy in the first place. Now, what is the source of the cause of that positive and negative energy? It's the quantum vacuum. And the quantum vacuum is emphatically not nothing. It is a roiling sea of energy governed by physical laws and having a physical structure. And that leads to the question, can that quantum vacuum be eternal in the past? And the answer to that question is no. You see, uh, quantum physics predicts that at every point in the quantum vacuum, a fluctuation would occur, which would grow into a universe. So that if the vacuum has existed from eternity past, for infinite time, universes would have formed at every point in the quantum vacuum, and by now have coalesced into one infinitely old universe, which contradicts observation. Therefore, Christopher Isham says, these models were not widely accepted. He said, in fact, this uh, difficulty proved fairly lethal to these vacuum fluctuation models. And as a result, he said they were jettisoned 20 years ago, and nothing much has been done with them since. Now, Dr. Stenger says, but uh, the vacuum is uh, a kind of nothingness out of which the universe might emerge. This is frankly an abuse of science. The vacuum state from which the universe is said to originate by a fluctuation is not nothing. It is a sea of energy. It is definitely not the same as non-being. And this vacuum state cannot be past eternal. In fact, in 2003, three cosmologists, Arvin Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin, were able to prove that any universe which is in a state of cosmic expansion on average throughout its history, cannot be eternal in the past, but must have had an absolute beginning, a past space-time boundary. But Lincoln pulls no punches. He writes in his book, Many Worlds in One, 2007, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, Cosmologists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And therefore, the scenario that Vic Stenger imagines simply doesn't work. There had to be a past space-time boundary and an absolute beginning of the universe. And that, I think, points to the existence of a transcendent creator, as I have explained. So, I don't think that this first argument offered by Vic Stenger is a good one. Now, the only other argument against God that I heard in that first speech is that there cannot be any mind apart from a physical brain. But even if that were true of human beings, that's no proof that an immaterial mind, God, cannot exist. And in fact, I think we are acquainted with ourselves as immaterial persons. Reductive materialism doesn't work because mental properties are not physical properties. For example, the brain is not jubilant. The brain is not sad. These are mental properties, not physical properties. Epiphenomenalism, which is the view that says the brain has mental properties, I don't think works either because it's incompatible with self-identity over time. There is no enduring self from moment to moment on this view. It's incompatible with intentional states, with having thoughts about certain things because uh, epiphenomenal states don't think about things. 
It's incompatible with freedom of the will because causation is a one-way street on this model from the brain to the epiphenomenal states. But the epiphenomenal mental states don't influence the brain, so there's no freedom of the will on this view. So it seems to me that we have very good grounds for thinking that we are not simply material mechanisms, indeed that we are uh, substance dualists. We're, we're a kind of dualism, interactionism of soul and body. We act as agents in the physical world through our bodies. God is a soul without a body, an unembodied soul, who is the creator of the universe. Those are the only arguments I heard in his opening speech against the existence of uh, God, and I think neither of them is persuasive. One last point I'd like to make in my last two minutes concerns the argument from contingency. Remember that argument said everything that exists has an explanation. Uh, if the universe has an explanation, it is in a transcendent personal cause, and therefore there is a transcendent personal cause. Now, Vick says in response to this, well, why think that nothingness is the default state? Uh, why not say uh, that nothingness would need to have some explanation? Well, I think it's very easy to see why nothing wouldn't require an explanation. Because if there's nothing, then there's nothing to be explained, right? There's just nothing. Indeed, it's logically impossible for nothingness to have an explanation, because if it did, then there would be something. So nothingness doesn't require an explanation. On the other hand, if something does exist, we want to know why it exists. Does it exist through a necessity of its own nature, or does it have an external cause? And my argument is that there must be a metaphysically necessary being, which is the cause of space and time, which exists by a necessity of its own nature, and explains why anything else exists. So the argument requires that there be a being beyond space and time, matter and energy, and that can only be a transcendent, external, personal cause, a soul, as it were, without a body. So, in conclusion, then, I don't think uh, Dr. Stinger's criticisms of my arguments are sound. I don't think that the two arguments that he gave for atheism are compelling. And so, on balance, I think we still have good reasons for thinking that theism is the more plausible worldview. Well, I don't know how you can say that my, my arguments uh, against your arguments are in sound when I haven't given them yet. <laughs> so let me give them. Okay, the ontological argument. I never quite understood that. Remember, I'm actually a scientist rather than a philosopher, so excuse me if I don't, don't see the, the, the logic behind that. Uh, I mean, for example, you can, you can make the statement that the uh, greatest possible pizza in the world exists, uh, uh, and so you know, therefore, therefore, there must be a greatest possible pizza. And I don't think there is the greatest possible pizza. So uh, why can't you say the same thing about God? The ontological argument uh, is a logical argument. It doesn't depend on anything that you observe, and it's something you have to understand about logic. Logic tells you nothing that you don't already know. It tells you nothing that's not already built into the premises. And so uh, you, can, you can make all the nice logical sounding arguments that you want, but they don't tell you anything that you didn't know. Uh, they just tell you that uh, something follows from uh, this or that or the other thing follows from, from your premises. So you, you can't use logic alone to find anything in fact, there's only two ways that we're supposed to know, be able to find anything about reality. And that uh, one is, is supposedly revelation, but we, I've argued that there's no evidence for revelation. And the other is observation. And many philosophers, such as Kant and Schopenhauer, have, have pointed out that uh, we really can't know uh, from observation alone what's, what's the true reality out there. And yet observation is really all, all we have and that's what science deals with, it deals with observation. Now, uh, let me get to these, these arguments having to do with cause. Uh, Dr. Craig says everything has to have a cause, 
Well, that's simply wrong. In quantum mechanics, events happen without cause. The uh, uh, atom.